right. Happy Saturday night, everybody. How's it going? Uh, it's been a while since we've um, we've seen each other. It's been a few weeks, and I actually have my Zoom on the grid. Man, this is awesome. Uh, I, I rarely do I ever get to see everybody, but uh, man, it's cool. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, a lot of new faces, a lot of familiar faces. So uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, Welcome, I'm uh, Scott Jones, Jones is Thirsty. Uh, hopefully, uh, y'all have already poured up a glass of this wonderful Albarino. Uh, if you haven't, uh, get to it. Now's the time, pour it up. Uh, very excited to have everyone here for this spectacular Spain uh, tasting. Um, but before we go any further, I wanna give a special shout out to all you moms and dads for making it through the first week of school. So let's raise a glass uh, in celebration. Uh, I know that uh, many uh, moms and dads out there had kids getting back to school. So I'm sure uh, that we could all use a, a celebratory glass of wine. So cheers. Cheers. Indeed. Um, for those of you who uh, are joining for the first time, if this is your first uh, Jones is Thirsty uh, session, uh, I wanna quickly run through just a few housekeeping things. Um, I, we, as always, uh, we want this to be very interactive. So um, you can ask questions through the group chat um, or you can unmute yourself and just ask, us, ask a question live. Um, you know, ask it, just jump right in. Uh, Carlos and I will be here to answer questions throughout the tasting, so don't be shy. Um, maybe a little awkward in the beginning, but I promise once the, the uh, relaxation of that first one or two glasses of wine mm -hmm. washes over you, hopefully uh, you'll feel confident and uh, you can uh, ask a question. Um, tonight's virtual tip jar is going to a terrific organization, uh, the Railroad Park Foundation. Um, as always, you can send those tips to Venmo uh, and use the handle Jones is Thirsty. Um, what's really cool is we've actually already, already started getting tips. Um, we were getting tips at like five o'clock today. So uh, awesome. Um, but that's where you're going to make the uh, virtual tips tonight. Venmo, Jones is Thirsty. Um, if you're um, doing something at home and you put out a cool spread and you're with friends, um, I'd love to um, have you post that on Instagram. I'd love, always love to see what people are doing in their homes. Um, Y'all do a great job of setting up these cheese and charcuterie boards and, you know, just having fun kicking back with friends. So uh, please do that. Um, and that's really it. We're going to keep it fun, hopefully uh, learn a little bit and drink some really outstanding wine. So um, that's really it for the housekeeping part. Um, I want to uh, welcome in uh, my buddy, uh, Carlos Cisneros. Uh, Carlos is a uh, certified sommelier. He's been a guest on several of these virtual wine events. Um, during the week, you can find him at uh, The Pleasure is All Wine, which is a terrific uh, wine shop in Pelham. So uh, why don't you say hello, Carlos, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, it's Scott. Thank you again for having me back on. Um, I really enjoy these and uh, don't let me talk too much because, uh, you know, I tend to ramble sometimes. But anyway, yeah, so um, uh, I'm based here in Birmingham, Alabama. I uh, work over at Pleasures All Wine. Uh, I'm also the wine director for two restaurants downtown, Bistro 218 and Boca. I write the, write the wine list for them and do staff training. Uh, I've been here this actually uh, August this month makes 20 years that I've been here in Birmingham. Fantastic. Past my yeah, I passed my sommelier certification back in 2012 here in Birmingham. And then right after that, I passed my certification in WSET, which is Wine and Spirits Education Trust. So yeah, I, I, I'm pretty immersed in the wine world and I just, I just like it. I just love wine, yeah. as we all do. Well, he's got a bunch of fancy degrees, everybody. The bottom line is he knows a lot about wine. And the cool thing about Carlos, and I think this is what uh, I really enjoy, um, uh, when I talk about wine with Carlos or when I see him interact with others is he really knows how to break it down in a way that makes people uh, really feel comfortable with wine and uh, really knows how to how to explain what is uh, can sometimes be a little bit intimidating. Let's be honest. So, Carlos, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, for those of you 
who've been in tastings in the past where Carlos has been a guest, you already know that he and I have this mutual passion for Spanish wine. So uh, we talked about this uh, in the past and so uh, cool that we could align that with um, this uh, fundraising event for the Railroad Foundation. So we're gonna look at three really, what we think are really terrific examples of Spanish wine from um, three really terrific wine growing regions. So um, I also wanna say, if you don't already have the red wines open, uh, go ahead and open those. Um, hopefully you're able to put each of the red wines in their own individual glass so you can kind of compare and contrast as we go through the tasting. But if you only have one wine glass, that's perfectly cool. Don't stress about it. But uh, go ahead and um, open those up so they can begin to breathe. Um, now, as I mentioned, and as all of you know, um, every one of these uh, virtual tastings um, has a, um, a charitable component. And um, tonight I'm, I'm really thrilled that we have um, uh, the virtual tip jar going to uh, the Railroad Park Foundation. Um, since about half of you are from outside of Alabama, I just want you to know that it's worth noting that the Railroad Park um, is recognized as being one of the top urban green spaces in America from a design and activation standpoint. It's really an amazing uh, park. And uh, I'm really happy to have Ty Williams from the Railroad Park Foundation, who's gonna uh, tell us just a, a little bit about uh, what the function of the foundation is and uh, what are some of the efforts and goals of the junior board. So uh, Ty, you there? Absolutely, can everyone hear me okay? Man, you sound great. You sound like you're sitting right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, well, as previously mentioned, my name is Ty Williams and I am the immediate past chair of the Railroad Park Foundation Junior Board. So please allow me to be the second to welcome you to a wonderful evening. As a courtesy, we ask that you mute your microphones to not interfere with Carlos and Scott's experience. Um, but I want to extend a special thank you primarily to Scott Jones with Jones is Thirsty for allowing the Railroad Park Foundation Junior Board to use this event as a fundraising opportunity. For those who are out of town and not aware, as you can see, Railroad Park is a 19 acre park in downtown Birmingham that celebrates the industrial and artistic heritage of this great city. This amazing green space has been open since 2010 and is proudly owned by the city of Birmingham. Recognizing our current experience with COVID-19, Railroad Park has had an increase of individuals and also families utilizing the space for some much needed stress relief, exercise, and a safe sense of social interaction. Tonight's virtual tip jar will directly benefit Railroad Park. As previously mentioned, your donations will have a tremendous impact on providing a place for these essential outdoor activities for the entire community. Virtual tips should be directed to Scott Jones's Venmo, which is at Jones is Thirsty. Also listed here are additional ways to support Railroad Park by setting up your Amazon Smile, gifting a membership, purchasing great birthday and holiday gifts, ranging from t-shirts to magnets and other paraphernalia, and also giving with our Adopt a Plant program. Lastly, Railroad Park is celebrating 10 years and we have a fun and entertaining virtual event coming your way. This event will be on Sunday, October 11th at 4 p.m. We hope you will consider joining us then. And as we prepare to see what the night brings and learn more from Carlos about our fabulous wines, from my heart to yours, near and far, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ty. Uh, man, just love what's going on down there at Railroad Park. Um, I can see many faces on here from folks in Birmingham, and I know that we would all share incredible stories about uh, concerts we've seen there, uh, you know, times we've just been able to go there and picnic and ride bikes. And um, some of us that have been crazy enough to hop into that uh, skateboard park and um, hit one of those little uh, bowls that you have there. There's, um, there's all sorts of ways to have fun there. And, you know, you've got close proximity to um, the Barron's Field, to good people, all the restaurants around there. It's just a, an awesome place. So uh, thanks for, uh, for everything you do there. 
Okay, so let's um, let's jump right into it. Um, I thought what I would do is um, is um, at least give everyone an overview of kind of where we're going to be going tonight. Okay, so uh, go ahead and uh, pour yourself again. F pop off your uh, Albarino. We're getting ready to taste that and and talk about it. But I wanted to give you some context about where we are. Spain is a big place. Um, lots of different wine regions. Lots of important cities. So um, we'll kind of start, um, you know, over on the um, uh, eastern side, you have um, uh, Barcelona, and, um, you know, that's uh, uh, just south of that. You have some very famous uh, regions there on the Mediterranean coast. They're known for red wines. That's also where uh, Spain's um, sparkling wine, Cava, comes from. Uh, so you, you may have had Cava. Um, but it's uh, a delicious sparkling wine that's made in the champagne method. Uh, down here at the bottom, Perez, uh, that's where sherry comes from, which is one of the world's uh, most famous fortified wines. And then if we move over to um, the west, uh, here down in Lisbon, uh, this is actually Portugal over here on the um, left-hand side. So that um, makes up uh, the other part of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, but Lisbon, famous port city. And then up here in Oporto um, is actually where all of the port, that's where the famous aging house is for port is. Um, it, the port, um, the grapes and the port is actually made right up here um, in the Duro Valley, which is right on the uh, border of Portugal and Spain. But um, actually the, the barrels are floated down the river and then they come in to port, um, uh, to Oporto where they're aged for years and years and years and then they, are shipped out through the Atlantic to all ports around the world. Uh, and then if you go, uh, and then if, and of course in the interior um, is uh, Madrid, um, another important uh, political center in Spain. But all of these little um, areas that are highlighted with a color are, um, are an important wine growing region within the country of Spain. We're gonna look at three. We're gonna look at um, uh, um, um, first at Rias Baixas, and that is actually, um, you know, up in the, the northwest of Spain. Uh, and the city there is um, uh, Santiago de Compostela. And that is not only a city, but it's also home to a very uh, famous, uh, the cathedral there, uh, which is, um, has the shrine to St. James. And it's the ultimate destination um, for the Camino de Santiago, which is a, um, you know, in terms of Catholicism is an incredibly important pilgrimage uh, that um, parishioners have been making since the, since the ninth century. And there's a, there's a, 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 a basically a, um, this trail that goes along the north of Spain, which cuts in from, um, from France, and the destination is, um, is at the cathedral. And it's actually just a stone's throw from where our first wine is produced in Rias Baixas. Um, the other thing to know is this part of um, Spain in the Northwest is called uh, Green Spain. And that's because uh, you can see the Bay of Biscay up here and you see the Atlantic Ocean. So these grapes are grown in a very close proximity to the ocean. Uh, and this part of the Atlantic Ocean is very cold. So you get lots of um, ocean influence there which means that it can be very rainy and kind of wet and cloudy, um, which is perfect for making cool, crisp white wines. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's important uh, in a minute. But just know that this is a, a cool region, a very wet region, and that's totally different from the two regions we will um, we'll look at next. So uh, let's go ahead. And if you have that bottle of Albarino, if you'd grab it, let's... Um, Let's take a look at the bottle. Um, you'll see at the top of this bottle, you see the word Albarino. That's the grape. That's the grape we're gonna be having in this first wine. Uh, Albarino is one of the, um, it's, it's perhaps the most famous white grape along um, the uh, Western seaboard there um, in Spain. And then um, the same grape is featured in a lot of uh, Portuguese wines uh, right in that area. Um, I also want to point out that um, down here at the bottom, you have uh, Martin Kodaks. That is the producer of the wine. Um, uh, I don't know a lot about Martin, but I've been told that he was a very famous poet 
And um, so this wine and is named after him. Um, and then right below that, you see uh, Rius Vicious, and that's the region. Um, it's not a grape, that's the actual wine growing region. And then you see um, what looks like DO. And um, that is uh, the, um, the uh, indication of quality uh, in, in Spain. And so it really denotes um, the place of origin and all over Europe, and we'll talk about this and Carlos will talk about it, in Europe, it's all about the place. Um, it's it, the place transcends the winemaker. So there, that certification shows you that this is one of the highest quality level wines, and it's specific to that region. And then you see 2018, which means that the grapes in this bottle were harvested in 2018. So um, let's take a look at the wine in the glass. Um, you can tell that it has a really kind of pale straw color. Um, and in mine, um, I actually get a little uh, hint of green. Um, and uh, it's actually pretty easy um, to see that if you have a like a white sheet of paper or, or a real light background, if you hold it to that, it really can tell you a lot about it, but you'll see that it's light. Um, and that tells you a couple of things right away. So the light color tells you that it was grown in a cool region um, and, ha and, it, and it hasn't been aged in, yolk, in oak. And we'll kind of confirm that, but those are just things you can visually see. Um, and that little hint of green tells you that it's a very young wine. So, um, you know, that's the color. It's very clear. Carlos, anything else to say about the color of the Albarino in your, from your perspective? Um, no, you nailed it. Yeah, it's, it is. It's, I, I see those little um, hints of green. The only other thing that I could really say is that there's a lot of like uh, light reflection from it. Yeah. You look at it and yeah. it's really, it's, it's brilliant in the glass. So another yeah. indicator of, of a very young wine. Uh, but yeah, I, I love wines like this. Really young. Uh, and they're meant to be enjoyed this way. I yeah, mean, that's how yeah. they're made, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, um, uh, let's give it a smell. Uh, and what I always, you know, encourage people to do is like take two or three big sniffs. You know, you don't have to get real fancy with it, but just, you know, kind of, you know, take a couple of sniffs and, and see if you can um, identify anything that might be in there. Um, I definitely get some, uh, some uh, kind of peachy aromas and um, like some apple. Um, maybe it's like some, you know, I get a, a, like a little citrusy thing going on too. And um, maybe some, uh, some flora elements. Carlos, you getting anything, uh, yeah. you know, kind of going on with that? Yeah, I get a, a, just a little bit of orange blossom and yeah. like uh, some orange oil. It is, it's, it's citrusy. And that's yeah. very typical of, of the Albarino grape to have like a, a little bit of like an orange scent in the background. Uh, yeah. That that type of grape gives off something what we call uh, terpenes. And those terpenes, oh, terpenes are, got it. Yeah, terpenes are typically like uh, floral aromas where you get uh, apple blossoms, orange blossoms. Uh, yeah, but that, yeah, I I totally get that. And yeah, it's clean and fresh. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing that really strikes me is that this is um is has a, a kind of a clean. I, I mean, that's just what I keep thinking is that clean and fresh. I mean, it definitely makes me want to want to take a big sip, which is what we should do now. So take a big sip, swirl it around in your mouth, um, and swirl it so it covers your entire mouth. Ah, my mouth is just watering <laughs> from that acidity. I love it. Yeah. Um, I get, um, I definitely am picking up on that orange tangerine thing, Carlos. Yeah. Um, of course, I grew up in the middle of orange and tangerine groves in Florida, so maybe that's kind of etched in my brain, but I definitely get that. Maybe some lime, um, um, some apple, uh, maybe like a Granny Smith apple kind of thing going on. Um, I, I was going to ask you, um, Carlos, you know, given its proximity to the ocean, um, there's a, I, I mean, I, I get, I definitely get a minerality, but I've, but uh, yeah. um, I've often heard there's a almost like a seawater salt, salty salinity quality to Albarino sometime from its proximity to the ocean. Yeah, I've I've had this debate with 
wine professionals before and honestly like i'm i'm looking for it too and i get just a little bit of that salinity but yeah. there was there was a, a i when i took my wset certification i was talking to a master of wine from london and uh i was telling him about you know the salinity that you get from albarino and he's like nah no such thing i was like <laughs> No, nah, I think there is. Yeah. And he's like, no, no such thing. And then you talk, I, I talked to a couple of master sommeliers. They're like, don't listen to the MWs. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but yeah. no, but no, seriously though. I mean, you think about it when you go to the ocean, when you go to Gulf Shores or, you know, where, you know, any ocean, you know, in the world, when you start to get closer to the, to the water, you can smell it in the air. You can kind yeah, of, oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and like, you can kind of feel it almost like you can taste it in the air. Well, a lot of the times with that sea spray, those vineyards are so close to the ocean. Like some of them are like practically just meters away from, from the yeah. ocean. And that salty, you know, the, the salinity in the air can adhere to some of the grapes. And you will get, not all Alber Albarinos, you know, there, uh, there's five growing, uh, uh, main growing regions in Rias Bacias, And not all of them are close to the ocean. And all of them throw off like different characteristics for Albarino. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's... It, it could be argued, but I do pick up salinity in some Albarinos, not all of them, but sometimes when yeah. I taste them, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's a, it, it could be a, a dead giveaway or indicator of, of Albarino. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to ask the question because I, I, I you know, again, we're, we all, you know, as we talk about, we learn about grapes and the influence of the, of the, um, the geography and the other, yeah. like the water elements. I mean, that's always something is when you have something that's grown near, especially an ocean like the Atlantic, um, sometimes you can pick up those things. I, th I think the one thing that surprised me about this, um, and I've had this wine many times, is but I'm reminded that um, I, I, in my mind, I initially want it to be really, really super light. Um, but mm -hmm. this actually has a little bit of body to it. I mean, it's it's not a, you know, I can kind of feel it on my palate. Um, and and so, like, as I'm thinking about food and wine pairings, man, my my brain just goes wild because this goes with so many great foods, especially in the summertime, because the wine's so refreshing. It's relatively low in alcohol uh, compared to wines from warmer regions, uh, but it's just a great food and wine uh, kind of, kind of uh, beverage. Um, and this is the part of the show, everybody, where um, I'd love to hear what y'all think about the wine. Um, you know, Carlos and I can talk all night long, and it, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we may not have any idea what we're talking about. It's totally subjective. So what, what else, um, what do you guys think about this wine? For Maybe for those of you who have only had Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc, you know, what do you, what do you think about the Albarino? Uh, do you have any kind of um, aromas or flavors that, that really uh, leapt out? Any kind of food pairings that you think um, are really terrific? Anybody want to um, uh, raise their hand or uh, jump in and unmute yourself? I see uh, Karen said it's, um, she really likes it. She likes the light, um, easy drinking quality of it. And I agree. I mean, I think Carlos and, and I would both agree, you know, when it's 90 degrees outside and 90% humidity, this is one of those wines. It's just really delicious. So anyone else have something they want to add? Sure. I heard a sure. Come on, jump I, in, step into it. Don't be afraid. I, this is Janice. Hey, Janice. Because <laughs> um, we, we loved Albarino. We used to, well, the first one I ever had it really was at Satterfields in Cabo Heights yep. uh, with the scallops. And, um, yeah, it's great. A little sweetness yep. with the scallops. Sure. sure. And, uh, so it's a great wine to have with scallops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, like I think about, I, mean, I think like about shrimp cocktail. I mean, let's just not get real fussy like, this with shrimp cocktail to me seems like a, a great uh, kind of pairing, but you're right. Like oysters, whether they're raw or steamed Ooh. or grilled, you know, calamari. Um, I, I think this wine would be awesome with like fish tacos. Like nothing like fancy, tacos. just go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, I like Albarino with uh, ceviche. Oh yeah, ceviche. well, yeah, yeah, that would be, yeah. that would be yes. a phenomenal pairing because you've got high acidity, another high acidity, so they, kind of softens each one of them, but brings out the sweet characters in that. Um, let's see, uh, looks like uh, Kim, you have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and jump in? Sure, I was just really surprised because I had never had this wine before. Yeah. And it's very light. I like the um, 
the um, easy of drinking it and uh, yeah. it paired very well with, I have a, um, some cheese here with it and it pairs very well with it. So I'm really enjoying this. I'm gonna buy good. it again. Good, good. What type of cheese? And, yeah. Uh, Kent, what kind of cheese do you have? I have a brie right now that oh, I'm tasting good. it with good. it. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, those really creamy rich cheeses with the yes. acidity. I mean, you, it's just- It uh, really brings it out. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, this is also a wine that um, I really like with spicy foods. Um, you know, um, whether it's, uh, you know, spicy Asian noodles or uh, cold noodles, but, you know, the, this is a, a, a wine that's, um, you know, really uh, links up real well with, um, with some of those uh, chili pepper kind of elements. Um, looks like, uh, yeah, Monique said this would be great with seasoned shrimp. Absolutely. I think this, th you know, I, if you guys ever want to just learn a little bit about um, this, the coast of uh, Galicia, there are some, you know, you can go to YouTube and they have people that actually like tether themselves by, it looks like they're rappelling, but they're rappelling down the cliffs into the ocean and they have uh, these the wetsuits on and they're like gathering up um, uh, clams and mussels and oysters and that's how they harvest a lot of this fresh shellfish so you got to think that anything uh, that comes out of those cold waters is going to be a, a really a terrific uh, match for this. Um, Eva said um, she really likes the uh, the citrus and um, she said it had a nice uh, minerality to it Carlos, um, help us understand when we talk about minerality, kind of what that means, because I think we can get our heads around fruit flavors and even some non-fruit flavors like orange blossoms and honeysuckle and jasmine. But what, what, do, you, what, do, what do we mean by uh, minerality in a wine? Uh, so in a lot of wines, you get this rocky, stony, slaty uh, minerality from it. Um, minerality is one of those descriptors that's really hard to describe sometimes like uh I, i've heard anything from alluvial river rocks to slate to flint yeah, yeah but uh so basically it's if i know I, we don't pick rocks up and put them in our mouths unless we were well, maybe when we were five right <laughs> but yeah but you know we can kind of remember those things uh, you know from you know when we were younger you know like yeah. tasting rocks and stuff like that's where that a lot of that minerality does come from but yeah. you, you figure Grapevines, they don't grow in good soil. Like they don't grow grapes in very fertile, uh, rich soil. Like grapes right. grow great in like the worst soil, rocks, right. clay, yeah. like, I mean, stuff that you normally don't grow stuff in, but gravel, like that's, that's where uh, 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 vineyards, they, they thrive. So with a lot of those rocks, you know, like whether you're in uh, the Southern Rhone or, you know, whatever, a lot of that, uh, you know, that the mineral, uh, the minerals that the or the water that the grape vines pull up through the ground uh, absorb a lot of those minerals, go right into the grapes and go right into the glass as well. So it's yeah. not like you, you, yeah, you, I mean, you, of course, obviously you're going to pick up mostly fruit flavors, or if you have a well oaked wine, you're going to get a lot of oak. But you know, minerality just kind of plays a back. It's kind of like the background singer of you know of the wine. Yeah, yeah, and that actually brings up a good point. First, let me just circle back and say I remember in one of the first wine classes I ever took they talked about uh, wet river stones. And I remember thinking, I, I, can't, I can't picture myself ever as a child sitting around licking those stones, but I, but I, I know what they were trying to, to um, communicate. But yeah, it's something kind of weird to get your head around. And the other is oak. And I, I think it's important uh, because the next two wines that we have, the red wines, will have some um, impression of oak. And, and then we get to the Rioja, you can actually get more of that pronounced oakiness. But one thing you'll notice if you go back and, and um, take a sniff of the Albarino is you don't smell any of those aromas that are usually associated with oak, like smoke or uh, vanilla or butterscotch or spice. Um, those are actually flavor components that come many times from oak. And you can tell part of that clean freshness is that this wine was aged and, um, and fermented and all stainless steel. So there's no outside influence from any other kind of vessel. It's all, you know, inert, uh, perfectly uh, flavorless, if you will, and just allows the freshness of the grapes to come through. So um, hope y'all like this wine. 
um, let some sit in your glass. And as it warms up um, through the night, um, you can go back to it and take a, take a big uh, a sniff of it and then actually uh, take another sip. And you'll see that actually some of those, um, those fruit flavors really start to come out as the wine uh, warms up just a hint and it'll actually change the way that it smells and tastes throughout the evening. So uh, good stuff. Okay. Now we're heading uh, to the other side of Spain. Uh, I'm gonna put the map back on so we can uh, take a quick look at that again for just for, uh, for reference here. But um, you can see that we're, we're heading back over uh, not quite to the Mediterranean on the Far East, but we're definitely um, on the eastern side of Spain. Um, we're, um, we're in a, an area that is, um, still has a pretty good elevation, so you're able to get really warm, dry days and, and fairly cool nights. Um, and um, um, this is um, the location. Uh, Caliatud is, is uh, where our next wine comes from. Uh, and that is um, Las Rocas. And um, this is the kind of the, the total opposite of where we just came from, Rias Baixas. Um, here uh, in this part of Spain, and as we'll see uh, once we get up to Rioja, um, you've got plenty of sunshine, plenty of warm days, and you need sunshine to ripen uh, grapes, and you need sunshine to create sugar. And if we think back to, you know, Rias Baixas, cold, cloudy, wet, um, those grapes um, really struggle to ripen and really struggle to um, create a lot, of, um, a lot of sugar. But what you do get is, is that bright freshness. Um, and that's, again, very indicative of a, a cooler climate. This is um, kind of on the opposite side of the equation. You get all that sunlight, photosynthesis is taking place. You still get good acidity, but now we're getting um, some real ripeness uh, in these um, in, uh, in these wines. And uh, both of these, um, um, this area, as well as as we get a little bit further north to um, Rioja, are, um, are really, um, really uh, unique in terms of uh, their ability to um, grow uh, this grape, uh, Garnacha, and uh, Tempranillo. So again, as we did with the, um, with the Albarino, let's, uh, let's look at the label. Um, you see, uh, Las Rocas, um, which is uh, actually the name of the wine. Uh, the producer, um, they're um, uh, kind of buried in some of the small print on the back, um, but uh, like we had Martin Codex on the last wine, uh, but this is um, actually the name of the wine is Las Rocas. So that's what they've chosen to, um, to highlight here. And then below that you see Garnacha, which is the name of the grape. And um, I'm often asked, you know, what are my favorite wine growing regions uh, and what are my favorite grapes? Um, I think um, at the end of the day, uh, Garnacha is my favorite grape. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Garnacha from the uh, Mediterranean uh, coast of Spain. I love it, um, Garnacha, uh, which is called Grenache in France. I love it from the Southern Rhone, but, um, you know, I, I think, um, I think, uh, Carlos leans a little more toward Tempranillo in, um, in Rioja, which is delicious, but I just have a thing for, um, for Garnacha. So that's the name of the grape. And then uh, the vintage date is uh, 2016. So again, that's when the grapes were harvested. So it's 2020 now. So we know that uh, already this wine has aged uh, four years. So, uh, and then at the bottom, you have um, uh, Calatiud, which is the region and um, this wine, like the Albarino, is a has a DO designation. So it's again, it's the um, it's it's a designation around the place of origin. So um, that means that this region is um, in this kind of pyramid of quality. It's at the top of the pyramid. It's a it's a recognized um, viticultural area where they're producing uh, really outstanding wines. So. That's a little bit about the bottle. Um, let's, um, let's look at this wine. Um, if, again, this, if you have like a really light uh, background or um, a white piece of paper, this is really where it helps. But, you know, uh, you know one thing, you know, aside from it being it's a red wine, um, to me, um, it's still, you know, it's, it has some translucence to it. 
Um, Carlos, would you agree? I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, it's not a wine that is real inky and, and like dark and opaque. I mean, it has um, some translucent. So, you know, you're getting some of that color extraction from the skins. And for those of you who don't know, when you take a purple grape and you squeeze the grape, um, the juice is clear. Um, the color of the wine actually comes, uh, is the result of uh, the winemaker leaving the skins in contact with the juice. And so the colors of the skins and the flavors and some of those phenolic compounds, they're all um, leaching into uh, the juice and turning it red or purple. So um, Carlos, since this is uh, kind of a, a lighter color, you know, what is that telling us? I mean, I, I, I know that Grenache um, oftentimes makes lighter wine, but what, what are some of the things we would know from having a, a relatively light translucent uh, red wine? Yeah, I've always looked at Grenache as kind of like a, a shade darker than Pinot Noir. Yeah. Because, yeah, when we're, when we're going through blind tastings, like, I'll look at something that's pretty, you know, trans, uh, translucent, and I'm like, hmm, that could be Pinot, or it could be, could be Grenache or, or yeah. Grenache. And actually, Scott, I'm, I'm on board with you. I'm, I'm more of a Grenache guy than oh, I am. Oh, good. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, gotcha. I love Grana. I, I think that's how we uh, decided to do the Zoom because that's we right. were talking it about is. our, yeah, our passion <laughs> for, for Spanish wines and inexpensive wines. But that's this, right. last, yeah, this has always been one of my favorite wines. And, yeah, you know, this I, actual wine, uh, Los Rojas, yeah. for years has been one of the world's great bargains for Spanish red wines and for Garnacha. Like the fact that it's at this price point, it still blows people's minds. It's a, it's a really great value. Yeah. So it's funny um, with it, it's funny with Garnacha. Ahead. I've I've always I've always made the joke that Grenache or Garnacha, which are you know completely synonymous. Uh, I've always said that if the color purple had a flavor, it would yeah. be Garnacha. It would be like, Garnacha. It, it tastes yeah. like it, it tastes like purple. It just it yes. just has, has like this gooey, not really gooey, but it's hard to describe. But every time like if if, if somebody hands me a glass and like here, guess what this is? If I start to taste, I'm like. That's Grenache, like, or Grenache, yeah. because yeah, it just has that like purpley, uh, grapey yeah. taste to it. It's like adult fruit juice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but in a good way, not in a discouraging way. So let's um, let's uh, let's um, see what we have in the glass from an aroma standpoint. Um, yeah, I mean, I, even even at that, I mean, I I, yeah, I smell like dark cherries and some raspberries. I mean, it just smells kind of delicious, frankly. It 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 really does. Mm -hmm. Um. I get a, a little hint of um, maybe some uh, vanilla in there that might uh, tip the hat to maybe having some oak aging, but not a ton, but it, it smells, you know, again, real bright, fresh fruit. Um, anything to add to that, Carlos? Yeah, totally. I, I, I think the, the grapes are really ripe. Um, I, I pick up like a little bit of a, a cooked or baked element to the uh, wine as well. Like, and that can be from the grapes being uh, in the sun for so long or getting yeah. a lot of heat exposure. Yeah, yeah, when, I mean, think about it. When you, when you put blueberries in dough and put it in the oven, you're getting blueberry pie. If yeah. you put these grapes out in the sun and if you're getting, uh, you know, let's say 12 hours, 13 hours, whatever of, of uh, just harsh sunlight, those grapes start to cook. And if they're yeah. not getting any water, any rain, you're gonna get that. And I kind of get that from this wine. Like there's, yeah, there's so like, a, like baked blueberries yeah, so that would be a, um, a, that aroma would tell you that it comes from a kind of a, a warm growing region as, yeah. a, as opposed to like a cooler red wine region where it's more bright, fresh, that, that kind of baked, um, which is not a bad thing. It just is what it is. Like you said, it, it's just a, a function of that, uh, of that region. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a sip and see what we have. Delicious. It is. It's really, again, mouth-watering. It's smooth, uh, really soft, um, so easy drinkable. Um, but um, I get tons of that fruit. Um, I don't get a lot of tannins on my, on my palate. Um, I just feel some of it, but it's real light. Um, again, like you said uh, earlier, um, Carlos, if, if folks like Pinot Noir, Garnacha is definitely this style of Garnacha would be something that they would also like would be great for them to try because it has Absolutely. that same um, kind of smooth uh, velvety easy drinking um, kind of um, 
kind of uh, element to it. Um, mm. I also get like a little bit of uh, earthiness to it as well. Yeah. Um, just, you know, I, I guess that's, again, indicative of that region, but um, it helps it from being too much of a, too fruity. It helps to balance that out to me, but I, I definitely get a little earthiness, a little spiciness. Um, yeah, I'm getting here. Um, uh, Jake said it's, um, it's, it's, you know, got that jammy, that really delicious jammy, jamminess to it. Um, and uh, Ken mentioned that it was, uh, had a little bit of a bite to it. It was a little strong. And I guess, Carlos, going back to what you were saying earlier, probably part of that heat, um, it's going to have a little bit higher alcohol level so that you're, you're probably, you, if you're getting a, a little, um, uh, it being kind of strong or hot, it's probably yeah. because it's, it's about 14 and a half or 15 percent alcohol. So it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's big wine in terms of. What's the, what's the ABV on this one? I think it's, um, my bottle is um, 14 and a half. So yeah. You know, oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. up there. That, that's where that's coming from. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. Um, and, and, and for everybody also, anytime, and if, if there's a bottle of wine and it says 13.5% ABV, they actually give them a, a 0.5 variance on it. So it could actually be 13% or 14%. But if a bottle of wine says 14.5%, they give them a 1% a, a yeah. variance. So that could actually be 15.5%. It's yeah, just, so, which is, those numbers which is, aren't always accurate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would still, I mean, for me, you know, again, um, I, in the summertime when it's hot, you know, if I'm looking for a red wine that goes with, with um, a lot of different foods, um, I think this is just a, a great, uh, this is one of my favorite wines with barbecue. There's no question about it. Um, yeah. I love this wine with barbecue. It's, it's like it was a match made in heaven. Um, and uh, it's just great around the grill. Uh, it's a great alternative to um, like a big heavy cab with that, you know, that just is so rich and so full bodied. You know, this still has, you know, it's, it's you know, pretty light on the palate, um, fruity, good acidity. To me, it's, it, it just lends itself to a lot of those kind of more summertime, you know, occasions and uh, foods. I agree. So, um, I'm thinking barbecue with this. Uh, Kim said she's um, having it with some beef, which is absolutely a great idea. I could totally see that. Um, and um, uh, I'd love to hear what, uh, what, what y'all are thinking in terms of uh, just the overall experience, the flavors, um, you know, some of the food pairing uh, kind of ideas. Um, anybody uh, have anything they want to add to this one? Um, you know, go. You can unmute yourself and and hop in. Um, I love this one with uh, like uh, um, uh, roasted red pepper hummus. You know, you've got that red pepper with that creamy hummus. This you know is great with like a a little uh, shredded uh, barbecue pork on top of it. Um, this is also great with uh, serrano ham. Um, I think about you know um, you know uh, aged cured. Um, uh, Spanish hams, or even you could use the Italian uh, prosciutto, but this and, and cured meats or something I think um, pair really well together. Uh, could go with lots of different cheeses. Um, smoked Gouda is a, is a great one with this, with this uh, wine. Um, someone have, jump in there. You know, we read your, we read your suggestion. So we went out to Johnny Ray's and got barbecue to go with this tonight. So yeah. Good so, suggestion. It's good. What's the verdict? Yes, no. Question. Yeah. That was you said. We did barbecue as well. It's great. Thank you for the yeah. recommendation. This is oh, awesome. yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, you know, if you're really adventurous and you go to like the full moon and you get the chow chow on top of the barbecue, that like <sighs> takes this to the next level because, again, just like Carlos was saying with the ceviche and the albarino, um, the, that kind of um, tart, um, uh, acidic chow chow on the on the smoky barbecue. It's like everything you want to pair with this garnacha in one uh, in one sandwich. But um, you know that's a, that's a that's a good one too. Um, that's exactly what we did. Yeah, awesome, very good, Bill. You get uh, you get um, uh, gold star for that. Well done. Um, Cameron said she paired it with the camembert, and that's a great one. Um, these um, you know kind of uh, uh, medium-bodied red wines like this, 
um, is, uh, and, and that some of those creamy, uh, rich cheeses are, are really wonderful because it, it has enough acidity to cut through that creaminess, uh, but really kind of can stand up to it. Um, so uh, Ernest uh, Chow Chow is, um, is like a, it's a, it's, it's like a, a slaw, but it's, it's uh, all of these um, kind of chopped uh, cabbage and um, some other vegetables. And it um, has a little bit of a, a, a vinegary, almost a, a not quite pickled, but very vinegary with some cumin and garlic. And it's chopped real fine. And uh, we put it on, you know, everything from fresh tomatoes to barbecue. Um, I grew up uh, putting it, my grandmother always had um, mm -hmm. fresh peas uh, and beans in the summertime. And I, I didn't even know it was chow chow. I just knew that's what you put on top of, um, on top of peas and beans. But um, it's really good on top of um, smoked shoulder meat that's pulled or chopped. You put a little bit of that on there with some barbecue sauce, get your bun on there. And uh, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, so I knew I was going to be doing the Zoom tonight. So uh, yeah. with the last two, well, with this wine and with the last wine, I'm doing uh, burgers. So I'm right getting on. the, but whenever I do burgers, I get the ground beef and I mix some chorizo sausage into it yes. and mix it all together and season it. Yes. So I'll be doing, yes. I'll be doing chorizo and beef burgers with manchego cheese on top of it with these oh, wines. That so is, that's, that, that's, that's the Rioja special right there. Um, yeah, I good. love that Rioja and chorizo are, are so you get um that that may be the um the recipe of the night, Carlos. You've been holding that one, man. Ah, come on. I I had to play my card late. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um uh I, I'd love to know, um, you know, I, I'm looking at um at uh the comment the chats here. Um uh, looks like Ari is having it with um a charcuterie board, which, you know, again. It's just like, a, you know, just a, a perfect combination of flavors, textures, all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could go on and on about, about this wine, but I, I just think it's a really uh, fun, delicious, easy drinking wine for the summertime. Uh, goes great with a lot of different foods. And um, if this is your first time to uh, Garnacha, um, and, and if you like this wine, you really want to think about exploring Garnacha from Spain because um, while there be some variants, th this is generally what you, this is what you get. Um, wouldn't you say, uh, Carlos? I mean, you're going to get a wine that's more um, more of that fresh fruit, easy drinking, smooth. So, I mean, this is kind of you know kind of what what you get in that region. Yeah. Well, I like it. It's not a real serious wine. Like it's you know it's one of those wines you drink every day. It's you know it doesn't have the heavy oak or you know yeah. all the other stuff that people like to do with wines. That, that you know they're just they're fun, they're easy, they're very inexpensive. And you know you and I when we start you know we talked about doing the Zoom is that's the thing about Spain is like the wines yeah. are so inexpensive. Like you 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 drink them and the quality is off the charts, and you're saving so much money and not spending yeah. you know breaking the bank on you know on on some of the stuff that you'll get from uh, you know from from the United States or even South America. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I would also say, you know, you, you know, I'm always about helping people find really great values. I mean, we do that in every tasting. Um, just to back up a little bit and to talk about some of the great things you could pair this with, we're talking about the summer, but this um, Garnacha from Spain is also great at Thanksgiving, you know, because it plays with just about everything at the table. So if your kind of default is Pinot Noir um, at, uh, at Thanksgiving, man, I would absolutely uh, recommend that you try a Garnacha because it's gonna be a lot cheaper. Uh, you're probably gonna have more consistency and quality and it's gonna do the same thing. Um, it's gonna be the folks who like white wine are gonna be okay with it. And the folks that like big heavy red wines are gonna be okay with it. It's great with sweet potato uh, casserole. It's good with green beans, with you know, a pork roast with a roasted turkey, it just goes great with, uh, with everything. So uh, I agree. Put, put that in your, uh, in your phone for, uh, as you start to plan for Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, now I have to say, I'm looking at the comments here. So Sue says she, they're having a barbecue with habanero almonds. Uh, that sounds Ooh. actually pretty great. Wow. Uh, wow. And then, um, Scott and Suzanne, 
are trying this with smoked almonds. Again, that's a great, uh, I mean, both of those, you've, you've got lots of stuff that's, that's pairing up with, um, with, uh, with all of these. Um, okay, Andrea, thank you for uh, reminding. Um, we're uh, about that time in the, uh, in the program. Uh, about to, uh, I just want to re-mention or, or mention again the um, virtual tip jar uh, for the Railroad Park Foundation. You can make those um, tips to Venmo and you send them to the handle Jones is thirsty. So Venmo, Jones is thirsty, and that's uh, the virtual tip jar. Uh, I'll mention it again before we close, but I um, just wanted to uh, remind everyone of that. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's go over to uh, Rioja, and this is perhaps um, the probably the most famous. Mean, you could make a lot of different arguments, but for most of us, this is probably the most famous um, uh, wine growing region in Spain uh, for red wine. Um, you can see it's in the, the north central part of, um, of Spain there, and um, uh, the, the thing to know about Rioja is that um, you see the Bay of Biscay uh, right there um, in the um, that north coast. And so the Bay of Biscay um, um, covers that north coast of Spain. It actually goes up and uh, wraps all the way up uh, through France and it um, has an influence in Bordeaux. But um, the Bay of Biscay is very cold. Uh, but the thing that, that makes Rioja so unique is um, just in the northern part of, of Spain here, running actually along that, um, that pilgrimage, the Camino uh, Trail there, is um, uh, the Cantabrian Mountains. And those mountains actually keep a lot of that, uh, that um, Atlantic or Bay of Biscay influence off of Rioja. So the mountains block that cool weather that moisture. So it, what it does is it creates in a high elevation, very cool nights, very dry, and, um, um, and uh, lots of sunshine. And uh, yes, uh, Jay had just um, actually had um, uh, asked uh, the, the numbers next to each one of these uh, cities uh, relates to its, um, to its uh, latitude. And uh, as we've talked about in the past, we have this, um, the, um, this kind of optimal uh, growing area in terms of latitude. And it's about 50 degrees latitude north and 30 degrees latitude uh, to the south. And so um, anything in below, you know, in between there is considered, um, uh, has the qualities to uh, grow really uh, terrific world-class grapes. So, 50 degrees uh, latitude would be right at the edge of it being too cold. Uh, 30 degrees latitude would be right at the bottom of it being almost too warm. But as you can see here, <clears throat> these regions of Spain that we're in are in the mid, you know, low 40s. So it's, you know, kind of prime uh, wine growing. Um, and there, obviously, you've got um, places like Portugal, where it could even be in the 30s. But because you have that influence of the cooling influence of the Atlantic, it actually, um, you know, actually makes it a little bit cooler. But yeah, Jay, um, I appreciate you asking that. Um, this gives you an idea of kind of where it falls in between that 50th and 30th um, parallel. So um, over here in Rioja, you can see um, these are, this is a, a, a kind of prime real estate here. Uh, and the um, yellow area on the left is, uh, is Rioja. And there's, um, this river that runs through here, the Ebro uh, River, um, again, has an influence where it adds, um, it helps to moderate temperature. So it keeps it from getting too hot in the summer and then too cold in the winter. So anytime you have a river or a lake, a large body of water, it really helps to, uh, to moderate some of those temperatures. So that's, a, that's an element that is another important feature in addition to the mountains north of that that make uh, Rioja, uh, such a, a wonderful wine growing region. And um, this is where we're going to find um, Spain's signature red grape, Tempranillo. Uh, and we had talked a little bit about that. But um, Carlos, help us, uh, if you will, understand kind of the difference between Tempranillo and Garnacha, because um, this Rioja 
is, you know, just looking at it in the glass, a little bit darker color. So I'm assuming this is, um, this, this grape is giving off a little more color from the skins and has some different profiles. So with uh, Tempranillo, in contrast with Garnacha, Tempranillo is a little bit more of a serious grape and it tends to be more rustic as opposed to Garnacha, which usually, uh, Garnacha is a lot fruitier, uh, yeah. more vibrant. Uh, Tempranillo uh, is, is more of like a, a drier, more rustic, uh, earthy grape, if you will. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, 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 there's a reason why they, they really like to show a lot of oak in this wine. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but okay. still, I mean, like alcohol, I like usually higher alcohol and they have, they tend to have uh, 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 a bit more acid to them as well. Yeah, well, let's, um, let's look at the label. So we're gonna learn a little bit about what's in the bottle. So you can see that um, uh, on the label, you have, um, you have the producer, uh, Marquita Caceres. And so, um, you know, uh, with the Las Rocas, you had the kind of the name of the wine. You didn't have the producer on there. On this one, you do, Mar uh, Marquita Caceres. And then right below that, you see the word Crianza. And this tells you um, that, you know, if you, if you know, if you study up on Rioja, this tells you uh, how long the wine would have been aged. So, um, Carlos, tell us a little bit about the different terms, like the Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva. You know, what do those mean? Because uh, this one obviously means something. Okay. Uh, so I didn't. I didn't go with that one. I took it a step up, just a notch higher. Went oh, with very good. So 2013 is the current vintage on this one, and it is a Reserva. Yeah. I love gotcha. this wine. Like, yeah. yeah so, um, all right. So in Spain, you have your designations. You have your DO, your DOPs, and then you have your or DOC, and then you have your DOCA. Now, there are only two regions in the entire country that have DOCA status, which is the highest status. You have Rioja, and then you have Prirat. So, and then right now uh, there's one other area that they've been looking at seriously that they think that they're going to give the, the status to, but that's, you know, that that's coming later. But uh, yeah, so it's the highest designation that Spain can give a growing area. Rioja being one of them. Well, across Spain, in Rioja in particular, you have three different levels uh, of, of oak aging. Now, when phylloxera hit in France, which, you know, France is you know, right above Spain, when phylloxera hit, uh, which is the, the, the root louse that ate up a bunch of vineyards and destroyed, you know, thousands and Every thousands of acres. World. Right, yeah. right. So this root louse ate up these vines and a lot of French winemakers took their winemaking south. And so they decided to go to Rioja. Well, phylloxera ended up hitting Rioja as well. But these French winemakers that came from Bordeaux, they were used to putting their, their wines in oak. Now, they, they could use uh, French oak, which is very typical, but then they would use American oak. Well, in Rioja, the typical style would be American oak, 100% new oak. And that's always been the style. Nowadays, some winemakers are kind of going towards uh, using French oak or a combination of American and French oak. But uh, the typical style is American oak. So if you have somebody that's a bourbon drinker or whiskey drinker, and they really want to get into wine, start with Rioja. Real is a really area, to, a really good area to go to because they age them, you know, for much longer. So the three, uh, the three designations that they are that they have, they have Crianza, then they have Reserva, and then they have Gran Reserva. Now with Crianza, the wine must be aged a minimum of two years, and of those two years, it has to be a minimum of six months. Most winemakers go much longer than that. So that's mandated for Crianza. And the size of the barrels have to be no larger than 300, uh, 300 liters. So um, you have more oak influence. Right, right. So yeah. your, your average barrel size is 225 liters. And there's a, you know, a, a maximum of 300. Now, the smaller the barrels, the more oak uh, influence you're going to get because there's, you know, there's more surface area to cover. Sure. So uh, with Crianza, it's uh, minimum two years, six months in oak. Uh, Reserva is minimum three years with one year in oak. And then with Gran Reserva, it's a minimum of five years with at least two years in, or, or 18 months, I'm sorry, 18 months in barrel. Now, m a lot of winemakers go much longer than that, but they, that's the minimum that they're that's held the to. And they got to yeah. hold them in yeah. bottle. Uh, so one of the wines that I have, I, I pulled out of my cellar, same producer. So Faustino, this oh, yeah. is the, yeah. So 
Uh, this oh, is wow. their Grand Reserva. So I'm drinking their Reserva right now. This is our Grand Reserva. And uh, this is the 2006 vintage. And 2006 is their current release. This is our current vintage. So Jeez. they wait 14 years before they even release this wine. Uh, yeah. I got a lot of respect for that. Like that's, that's really cool. And also it, it, the, these uh, cages, the gold cages that they put around the bottle, that's, a, that's something centuries, centuries ago that they came up with. Uh, you'll see it sometimes in other countries, but Rioja is very popular for it. Yeah. It's, it's because back then they were, um, uh, uh, what is it, uh, duplicating wines. Yes, uh, so they were pulling right. out the cork and then putting in crappy juice and then selling it as Rioja. But this seal right here just indicates that it hasn't been tampered with and that it's, that it's the real deal, that it's going to be the juice that the producer put in the, in, in the bottle. But yeah, uh, yeah so with, with that, uh, you know, that's the typical style of Rioja is to have, uh, to have that new oak influence. Now, whether they're doing 30%, there's, there's no percentage mandated on how much they, it could be 100% new oak, it could be 30%, 20%, but with producers, the the more oak the better so yeah. a lot of the times yeah. they'll take new american oak and and they'll they torch the insides of these barrels so they take american oak barrels and they torch the inside and what that does is it causes the wood to caramelize and it gives this uh it, it gives off these vanilla flavors which actually i think if i'm not mistaken the 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 correct word would be like the vanillin um ex or the uh vanillin uh, compounds that they have inside yeah. the barrels yeah. the, the same that's the same the same uh, a compound that's in the vanilla beans is the same compound that's in wood. Correct. And so when you toast it, yeah, it caramelizes it, and that's how you get that aroma of vanilla in, in American oak. Right, right. So a lot of people will say it'll, it'll smell like a, a coconut or yeah. uh, sweet and sour, um, you know, vanilla, bourbon. I know a lot of the times yeah. when I pick up, I'll pick up some Riojas I smell, I'm like, ooh, that smells like bourbon. Uh, so a master of wine, actually, like in, in blind tasting, uh, he taught me because we always look for these markers. Like we always want to yeah. have these markers for wines whenever we're we're um, we're tasting wines. But he told me he's like, think A one sauce, A one yes. steak sauce. Now yeah. smell your wine. And I smelled it. I was like, oh my god, it does. It smells like A one steak sauce. That's so funny. Like, but a lot of it has to do with like the um, the uh, uh, the acid or even the um, uh, what's it called? Oh my god, I'm drawing a blank with this. Uh, I'll remember. <laughs> I'll remember it later. <laughs> Well, let's look at the let's look at the wine because yeah, this to me is um, much darker. Um, you know, I, I like uh, that um, the Garnacha was a little more purple. This has a little more red to it. Uh, you know, much deeper, richer. Um, I mean, it's still a little translucent around the edges. So I mean, it's still kind of a, a youthful in terms of Rioja, but um, you know, it's um, it's a it's a again very beautiful wine. And from an aroma standpoint. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I mean, I, it's just, it's like, I, to me, I, I get, um, like some cranberries, uh, plum, um, definitely some spiciness that wasn't, um, there with, um, with that garnacha. I mean, the aroma on this one is, um, really, uh, I, I use, I think, I think I use the word delicious here, uh, as how I would describe it. I mean, it makes me want to, uh, dive into some, a big, you know, plate of something, something yummy. Yeah, the, um, the, the intensity is high and the complexity on this wine is high as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and let's, uh, let's take a, a big sip of it and see what we, because I, I want everyone to kind of get that, that uh, tannin uh, experience. You know, you can feel on the top of your tongue as your uh, tongue kind of dries out there, um, those are the tannins, um, and those uh, come from the grape skins. They can come from the from the oak. Uh, they help the oak age. I mean, they help help the wine age. They also um, help to um, uh, cut through some of the richness of of really uh, kind of um, fatty foods. So if you had a a steak with some fat on it, the tannins help to stand up to that. But you can you can feel that. I mean, these are fairly. I mean, pretty pretty light uh, compared to some some bigger wines, but you definitely feel a difference between this wine and the uh, and the Garnacha. But to me, this is still a pretty pretty smooth, you know, wine overall. It's um, 
got to me still a lot of that freshness, a lot of the fruit. Um, I even get um, a little bit of licorice, um, I, I think, on this one. That was kind of one of those things that was um, kind of popping into my brain was um, I keep thinking licorice for some reason. Yeah. And you also get a lot of uh, baking spices. You can get cloves. Yeah, cloves uh, and nutmeg. cinnamon. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, what, uh, what do you guys uh, think about this one in terms of, of uh, flavor? Uh, anything uh, jump to mind in terms of what you're, what you're tasting? Again, totally different than what we just had with the, um, with the Garnasha. Um, anybody have any comments they, they feel comfortable sharing? Okay, well, I'll take that as a, um, uh, as, a as a, let's see. Wait, uh, Kim says she's having it with dark chocolate, uh, loves it. Um, let's see. Um, we've got, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen was saying that um, she feels like it, it starts um, uh, very smooth. Um, she likes the kind of the texture of this wine. Um, you know, I, I think um, in terms of food pairings, you know, Carlos mentioned before uh, the chorizo, uh, that's kind of a, you know, great classic pairing with this. Um, something like smoked brisket sliders, you know, smoked brisket is great with this. Uh, again, you like that smoke, you like the, um, you know, that, that kind of barbecue, but, you, but that the meatiness of the brisket is wonderful. You know, dark chocolate's great. This is great with uh, uh, manchego. Uh, or uh, uh, Parmesan cheese, but Manchego is the kind of the classic, classic Spanish cheese. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, great, uh, just a great food wine. Jay's saying that um, um, it's got a kind of, um, uh, kind of a tobacco-y um, kind of uh, uh, feel to it. And I guess Carlos probably getting that from uh, some of that oak influence a little bit is getting some of that smoky tobacco-y uh, kind of richer, leathery kind of uh, flavors and aromas. And I, on the one that I'm drinking, which is pretty consistent with the uh, the wine that you guys have, it's uh, the 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 fruits aren't as ripe and vibrant. The, the, yeah. It's more like fig and prune. Yeah. You know, that's like, like uh, uh, pomegranate is another yeah. another flavor yeah. that I get from from this. Uh, but yeah, it, the oak aging on it definitely the the vanilla really is integrated well with the uh with the wine itself yeah yeah um i agree it's um it's uh it's really uh it's a delicious wine and ernest is um just uh, sent a note saying that he's um he's having it with the manchego and and absolutely loves it absolutely loves it which is i mean it's like a again a kind of a match made in heaven you've got you know two products that are made in the same country They've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. They know something about it. Um, let's see. Um, um, Cameron said, Teresa for the win. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and uh, real quick, Carlos, uh, Jay wanted to know uh, what was the price point on that, uh, the Faustino Grand Reserva? So that's what I so We can ask it for a Christmas present. Right. It, it's, it's not very expensive at all. Like uh, the Faustino, I I think it's uh, probably in the thirty, maybe forty range for the for Osex. I and I know the um the Reserva goes for anywhere for like low twenties, and sometimes can get yeah. in the in the teens, which is yeah. ridiculous considering, you know, the amount of work that they put into making these wines, and you know the cost. I mean, new oak barrels, uh, uh brand new American oak barrels go for twelve hundred dollars a barrel. And if they're using, yeah, if they're using, you know, 500 barrels, maybe 800 barrels, and they're paying 1200 bucks, you know, that's for first and second use barrels. But by the time that barrel turns, uh, you know, second use or third use, they're only worth like, like three or $400. And they, they yeah. it's like a car. <laughs> the, 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 the depreciation is, is that dramatic. So it's like they're paying $1,200 for these barrels. And then, you know, a year or two down the road, they're only worth like about three or $400. They sell them off to other wineries that want to use them for, or, or even like uh, 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 distilleries to use yeah. for, um, you know, for, for spirits. The barrel program, but, yeah. Yeah, so that and uh, I saw another value. question on there, the difference between American and French oak. Uh, that's, that's another. So with American oak, sometimes I'll get dill and coconut. And with French oak, I get more spice and it's more subtle. 
but um, you know, talking to master sommeliers, it's, it's a lot of fun because, you know, I'll say, so what's the difference between, you know, if we're blind tasting and I'm like, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm picking up French oak on this wine and I kind of describe it and they're like, good call because it wasn't in French oak. But then, you know, I'll talk to another master sommelier and they say, do not, do not ever distinguish the difference between French and American oak. Just call new oak. That's it. Because there's yeah. no way you can describe, you, you can, you know, and then I go to another master sommelier and I'm like, well, I talked to this guy and he said, and he's all like, no, don't ever listen to an MS. They have no idea what they're talking about. I'm like, but you're an MS. And like, we, we, we just got a certificate and that's it. He's like, don't listen to what yeah. we say. I'm like, then why am I paying you 50 bucks for this class <laughs> to not listen to what you say? But anyway, I'd say French oak is more subtle and it has a little bit more spice to it and has those uh, nice, um, those th those really nice like uh, sweet and sour characteristics then yeah. French, our, our American oak to me is more robust uh, has more dill and coconut aromas than and vanilla vanilla is a, a big yeah. one with American oak yeah yeah um, and um, Monique I'm looking at your comment and um, she said she's she's having it with um, smoked ribs and manchego and I'm like man I'm coming mm -hmm. to your house Monique just uh, go ahead and type in your address and just make sure there's some leftovers that sounds like the perfect Rio, uh, um, Rioja meal. That is, that's, that's the best. Um, okay. So we're at a uh, little after eight, uh, as always want to be respectful of your time. Uh, there are some questions that, uh, Carlos and I are going to stick around and answer if you have time and want to hang out a little bit longer, but I know some of you, uh, uh, may, uh, want to duck out now, but, uh, for those of you who are going to duck out, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, being a part of tonight's tasting. Uh, remember, uh, you can support the Railroad um, Park Foundation at uh, Venmo at Jones is Thirsty. Um, I have uh, another uh, wine event coming up in a couple of weeks that I'll share with you all. Uh, probably going to focus on California wines, but, um, but I'll let everyone know. So again, thank you for joining if you, if you need to duck out. Um, but if you want to stay, uh, please do. Uh, I, I know I've got some wine left and there are some really great questions uh, that are being asked, and uh, we want to take a slightly deeper dive into those. Um, so um, let's see. Um, uh, Scott, with, yeah. with your permission, I wanted to uh, mention like a couple wines that people may be interested in as well. Absolutely. That Fire away. And, That's and, why you're here. And my yeah, path yeah. Of, of drinking. Okay, so everybody has this thing, you know, like don't drink wines with a screw top. Don't drink wines out of a box. Well, guess what? The wine professional, guess what he has in his refrigerator? This huh. stuff hey. is amazing. It is so good. So if you, if you were to come to my house and open up my refrigerator, there's a gallon of milk, there's orange juice, and then there's this. This That's is a my Spanish... refrigerator. <laughs> Boom. There you go. I yeah. love it. I love it. So this is 100% Viura. Um, it, that's the grape and Viera is real popular in Rioja since we were talking about Rioja uh, they're mostly yeah. known for reds but they do do a lot of whites as well and uh, if, if a white wine wants to have like the Crianza Reserva Gran Reserva uh, they also have mandates uh, on what they need to be how they need to be oak aged but they're not as long as reds but anyway so it, it, uh, box wine uh, is equivalent to four bottles of wine so when you buy one, especially when you find a really good one, they are out there. And a lot of people yeah. think that, you know, like, well, box wine's cheap. It's, you know, Franzia, it's garbage. You know, people don't know. I, I, I will argue that because like, I have a, a box of this in my fridge constantly. And if I run out and it's not there, I'm pretty upset. <laughs> but anyway, that one. And then um, I was drinking this last night. Uh, one of the reasons why I was feeling a little rough today, uh, but this, uh, Bierzo, this is Mencia. Uh, Bierzo is in northern Spain. Uh, it's an area that's known for one grape, and that's the Mencia grape. Very, very, very similar to Garnacha, uh, but I think with Mencia, it has a little bit more tannin. It's a little more astringent, uh, more depth, more color, and extremely affordable. Like it's it, and once again another wine that I I absolutely have a passion for. And if I find wines like, you know, from uh, Mencia or uh, Garnacha or even White Vieras, uh, you're going to find them. They're, they're crazy and expensive. Like this box wine, it, like I said, can ho hold literally four bottles of wine. When you pay $23, $24 a box, yeah. it, it comes out to like $3 a bottle. 
three three yeah, fifty three eighty something like that. It's, so it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And also, and, and uh, Carlos, uh, that Viera, that's the um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the most widely planted grape in all of Spain, isn't it? I mean, that's because uh, that goes into brandy production. It goes into white wine production. Um, right. I mean, I've always heard that is that that's planted everywhere. So it's you know having get it in that format is like a is a great bargain. Yeah, it's it's a very easy grape to grow and it's very profitable, believe it or not. <laughs> like some, I don't even know how a lot of these wineries in, in, in Spain make money. There was a yeah. guy, there was a wine that we used to carry called Clos and yes. uh yeah, so Clos it was a crianza and the winemaker from Spain was talking to me about his wine and I was like, oh, crianza, cool. So we poured it, we tasted it and I was like, what's wholesale cost on this? And he goes, ah, $6.50. I was like six fifty. Uh, this wine blew me away. Like I would have paid thirty bucks for this bottle happily. Yeah. And I was like six fifty. So we'll put our markup on it. It's gonna be less than ten dollars a bottle. I was like, that is insane. I'm like, how are you even making money? And he's like, oh, ah, yeah. it's my family, you know. But you know, a lot of these people in Spain, they've owned that land for centuries. So they don't have, you know, it's been in the family. You know, like oh, you know, let's say I'm a eighth generation, seventh generation winemaker. And, you know, our families own this land and, you know, the, the vines are old. So, you know, they don't have a lot of overhead. It's not like Napa where you're paying, you know, $1.2 million Absolutely. for a hectare. You know, yeah. then they got that bank note that they got to pay. And you got to, you know, your investors, they got to make money. So that's why Napa wine can get so expensive. And then you buy high quality, just passionately driven wines from Spain that are amazing. And you're, you're, yeah. you're paying almost nothing for them. You're paying what you would pay for a, 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 a number two combo at McDonald's, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, it's, uh, it, I mean, the values are, are really, um, are, are tremendous. And, um, oh, without a know, doubt. It, and it's, and it's an easy, it's an easy, um, there, I mean, it's a big, it's a big country. They make, they produce a lot of wine, but it's an easy place to kind of jump in and, um, and uh, give it a shot. Uh, so I would absolutely encourage all of you to, um, uh, to, to, you know, explore it. Um, and, the, and it's, to me, it's a region um, that their wines, especially in that northern swath uh, that we explored tonight, really go well with the kinds of foods that we're eating right now. I mean, it's just, they're, they're good values. Um, they are uh, easy drinking and people absolutely love them. And especially in that box format, uh, that's, I think today, that's where all the, all the cool kids are drinking that, uh, you know, there's nothing to be, uh, to feel the least bit uh, awkward about uh, having a, a wine that comes out of the box. That just, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, they're great for the pool, great for parties. Um, there's a, 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 a guy on this, uh, on, on the tasting tonight, uh, Jay, he and I were, uh, went to the lake with about 15 of our buddies last week. And uh, we had a, a box rosé, and that thing was gone in about ten minutes. Uh, it's it's just it's a there it's a great uh, great way to get a lot of bang for the buck. Um, Carlos, uh, we had uh, a question. Uh, we had a lot of questions. I just went we had through. tons of questions. It's <laughs> really great. Um, yeah. I think it was um, it was Kim. Maybe she wanted to uh, uh, go one level deeper on. Um, on phylloxera, and I thought maybe you and I could could chat about that for a second. So, um, as uh, Carlos mentioned, it's a it's a louse that uh, that um, uh, affects the rootstock of the vine, and it basically um, shuts down photosynthesis in the vine, so the vine just kind of dies. Uh, and um, it it, um, uh, it you know it, it came from America and then went to Europe. And went all over the world and absolutely, <laughs> yeah, uh, decimated every vineyard uh, and every wine growing region in the world. I, I think, I, except for Chile uh, yep. and um, some parts of, of of maybe New Zealand, I think. But um, it still continues to um, creep up today. But it absolutely decimated the entire uh, wine uh, world uh, in the um, in the early 19th century and. Um, so what they what they did to remedy that is they realized that American rootstock um, was um, uh, um, you know had a natural um, uh, resistance to phylloxera. So now um, I think I mean isn't it safe to say Carlos that every vine that's planted 
anywhere in the world has American rootstock and then the um, the original clone wherever it comes or the you know the root the original rootstock whether it's from Italy France wherever it's from is grafted into that so yeah. it's now a basically phylloxera free but um just tell us a little bit Carlos if you will how that grafting works because that's yeah. I mean there's now there are whole machines that just graft the rootstock or the American rootstock on to the actual um, spur that's going to be planted in the ground. Yeah, so I mean, what an American thing we did. We, we, so we send them this, this root louse that destroys all their vineyards. We find out that American rootstock is resistant, and then we sell them all the <laughs> rootstock and we make money <laughs> yeah, off of it. That's right. Like, really? <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, what they do, okay, so when you take a grape, let's say it's a Cabernet grape, right? You get the seeds out, you plant it in the ground, you're going to get Cabernet, right? No, you don't. You get a whole different grape. So if you plant 20 Cabernet uh, seeds, you're going to get a different grape every time. So the way that they get, uh, uh, they keep doing ca Cabernet is they, they graft the vines onto rootstock. So they plant the rootstock, rootstock grows, and they cut like, you know, just little slits in the side of the rootstock. And then they shove that vine in there and they graft it. And then the, you know, they, they fuse and that's how they start their, their vines. And that's why they could do different trellisings and different ways, you know, like you'll see like uh, some uh, vines, they kind of go up like this and then some they're like hanging overhead. You know, it's the way that they graft it onto the rootstock. But yeah, so the, the American rootstock was shown resistant, but now the phylloxera uh, louse is still out there. And from what I've read, like it's actually morphed a little bit now. <laughs> so yeah, they may end yeah. up having problems with it. But it, it, it right. doesn't, yeah, it doesn't do sand. It won't go in sand. Like it goes in all the other soils. It stays away from sand. Doesn't like cold climate. Doesn't like extremely hot climate. Uh, so we got that going for us. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, so that, that's basically what phylloxera is. A little bug that just ate up the rootstock and, and destroyed thousands, if not millions of acres and, and uh, caused a pretty big problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, and uh, it's really a fascinating story. Uh, if y'all are ever uh, bored and, and want to read up on uh, a piece of wine history, I mean, there have been whole, you know, anthologies written about uh, phylloxera and, um, and, and just what a worldwide, uh, I mean, it just devastated the industry uh, across the world. And it had to be, um, all the uh, uh, vines had to be pulled up and replanted, and again, they're they're still having to do a little bit of that today. Carlos, before um, before I forget, there are um, a lot of comments on here from people who want you to hold up that box wine again. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, Vera, absolutely. So they, and you can um, tell them, um, uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, this would be a time for you guys to take advantage of uh, taking a screenshot or um, or uh, using your uh, mobile phone to take a picture of it. Um, I know here in Birmingham, it's real easy to find. You can get it at Pleasure is All Wine. Um, I saw it. I, you know, yeah, um, you know, <laughs> most of the uh, local wine shops will have it. Um, and, and I mean, and, and that's, um, that's a brand that's actually getting a lot of coverage. So whether you're in Birmingham or you're in a state outside of Alabama, you should be able to find that uh, in your local market. Um, Carlos, uh, Jay asked- That was the Mencia that- uh, I don't carry this one. I tried it for the first time yesterday. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, so one of my wine reps uh, had called me yesterday, and she's like, "Hey, I got, I got, I got five bottles of wine. I need you to try." And I was like, "Well, I'm not going to have time for an appointment. I know it's you know short notice." I said, "But I, I got, I had to take my kid to you know his uh, uh, football game. He's not a football player. He's in band. No, as he should be. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a football player. Anyway." Uh, so she's like, well, I could just drop them off at the restaurant. You come pick them up and take them home with you. And I was like, I think that's a great idea. So the, each bottle had, was about half full. So I had five bottles of wine last night sitting in front of me. And after the football game, you after listening to that loud band in my ear, you know, like, like just a couple meters away, I was ready for some wine. And yeah. you know, I'm not one to waste <laughs> anything. So I, I tried to drink all of it. <laughs> that's right. I was almost successful. You're not my a wife down a little bit, but. Yeah, so I woke up today, I was feeling a little rough, and I was like, eh, I shouldn't have tried to drink all that wine. It's not, not a very smart thing to do. But yeah. hence the reason, like, like before, before I got on the call, I, was, I, I went and rode my bike because that kind of, I, I needed some adrenaline, like something to sure. kind of get me going. But 
Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, and, and, and for all of you, it, it, if you feel rough the next day, coffee doesn't work. All of those gimmicks, they don't work. Get outside and go running or go ride your bike because the two ways the alcohol escapes your body, through your breath and through sweat. Those are, the, those are the ways that your body expels. That's why whenever you get pulled over, they give you a breathalyzer. Alcohol is coming through your breath. So if you, and, and actually, a friend of mine taught me this. He's like, go get out there, go running, get all that sweated out, breathe it out, and you know, it'll, it'll, it'll leave. So uh, that's why I had to do a little bike ride before I got. I'm still wearing biker shorts right now. I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Let's see. Um, uh, Daniel, he had asked... Um, uh, a really great question, Carlos. He'd asked about the lifespan of um, of vine. So, um, uh, is it true that um, kind of you you plant the vine takes about five to seven years for them to start right. producing fruit of yeah. real quality, and then you right, know, right. most commercial vines what last you know fifteen twenty years uh, before they have to. I mean, I know there are some old vines that can keep producing really, you know, limited amounts of fruit for yeah. 50, 60, 70 years. But generally speaking, what's the typical lifespan of a commercial vine? After their 20 year mark, they start to decline. So the first three years, they're, they can produce, but not grapes of, of quality. About right around five or six years is when they start producing grapes to where they can start making wine. They hit their stride at like 10 years. After 20 years, they start to decline. But there are some vines out there that are over a hundred years old. And I, yeah. I, yeah, look on the internet, look at pictures. These things are gnarly. They look really weird. But yeah, there are some uh, vines. Now, they start to produce less fruit. Now, a lot of winemakers, and I agree with them, they'll say that they produce less grapes, but the quality of the grapes are much better. A vine can produce up to seven or 800 grapes, and they can usually get, you know, um, no. I'm wrong. It takes about six or is it, is it 300? Oh my God. I'm forgetting my numbers because like, I think it's like 400 grapes to make one bottle of wine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that, that, you know, a vine can produce a lot of grapes, but as they get older, uh, the, the quality of the grapes go get higher and yeah, but but, the output. So, right, right. So, yeah. and there's less, there's less production. I grow yeah. a lot of tomatoes out in my garden. And that's usually what I focus on. I want less tomatoes, but I want these tomatoes to be really good. The more tomatoes you get, they get kind of green and they're, they're, yeah. the skins are thicker. But anyway. Um, yeah. Concentrating flavors, all correct. of the energy goes into that yeah. smaller bunch. They're getting all the good stuff rather than yeah. spreading it out over a bunch of, a bunch of grapes. It, it really depends on what the winemaker wants to do. Because a lot of the times, like when they go, oh, 20 years, we're pulling them out and we're going to replant uh, you know, some winemakers are like, no, 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 we want these vines to get as old as they possibly can because that's the style of wine that I want yeah, to make. So it really right. depends on, it, it depends on the person that's producing the wine. Yeah, great. Thank I have, you. I have a question, actually, if I may interrupt. Sure. Yep, go for it. Um, so I have, I went to a vineyard in Rioja and called Eguru Nugarte, and I got a 2014 Crianza which is 90% Tempranillo and 10% Garnacha. How long will this be good for? Should I drink it as soon as possible? <laughs> drink it tonight. <laughs> We've been through three already. We've been through three <laughs> yeah, bottles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so to answer that question, and, and a lot of people will ask me, you know, what wines should I age and what wines should I not age? Uh, about 95% of the wines that are on the market right now are to be consumed within two to three years. Only about 5% of the wines that are out there, they'll actually age. Rioja is a great wine to age. They're actually made to age. So yes. like I said, you know, I mean like Rioja, I've, I've had Rioja that's been, you know, 30, 40 years old and it's fantastic. So oh, these wow. wines oh, age wow. very well. Yeah, so with, with uh, the two things that'll help a wine age, acidity, and tannin, more acidity yeah. than anything. Everybody always thought that it was tannin, but you know, acidity, they started sure. drinking old wine. Yeah, they started drinking old wine like 30, 40 years later, and there's like, yep. it still has tannin, you know? So sometimes yeah. it'll soften, sometimes it just won't go away, but uh, it's, it's typically the acidity in the wine. And, and Rioja, like I said, Tempranillo tends to have higher acid. That's one of the yeah. reasons why they age it in oak for so long, is because they really need that wine to soften. Yeah. So another, another uh, kind of, to um, ex just take it one level deeper to that one, Carlos. 
often people ask, well, what do I do if I don't, you know, I have some wine left over in the bottle. How do I store it? Um, the truth is, is for like that Grenache and this Rioja, because they have such good acidity, um, if you have any left over, you can put a cork in it, put it in the refrigerator. It, oh, yeah. it might very well be better tomorrow. Um, it now. has enough acidity that um, mm. the wine will continue to just open up. And so um, even red wines that are high in acidity, um, they can often, often be better even the next day. And that Albarino, if you have any of that left over. <clears throat> so good, it, warm that. Yeah, put it, put it in the refrigerator. The acidity level in there will, will let that, those wines keep for, you know, another day or two. Uh, they'll be just fine. So uh, definitely don't, don't fret uh, if, you have, um, if you have leftovers. Uh, I, I want get to get, get to, um, uh, um, there was a question here about um, uh, where to visit in, in Spain uh, for wine, uh, you know, to visit wineries um, outside Anywhere. of Barcelona. So you, yeah, you have like Panetas, you have all of those regions um, just outside, but you could take a, you could take a train from Barcelona into um, Hero, into Rioja, and be like at ground zero in no time, and you could spend weeks there. Uh, but that would, that, to me, that would be the kind of the, the next great spot right out of, of Barcelona if you had another day or two would be to shoot over to Rioja, because it's really not that far, whether you drive. I mean, I, I would just take the train because it's so easy to, to get around there, and it gets so mountainous right there in Rioja that, you know, um, you know, why, why drive when you can just take a train? But that's, that'd be a great place to explore. Um, you know, tons to see, great food, um, easy places to stay, and it's just a beautiful part of Spain. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much anywhere. I mean, do you, I mean yeah. there's so many areas. I know we talked about, we talked about Rioja, we talked about Rios Bacios, and, you know, and, and the Garnacha, but it's like, I, it, we barely touched just the tip of the iceberg the wines that you can get from Spain. I mean, we, we didn't even talk about Toro or, I mean, like, oh, no. yeah, or, of course. Uh, you know, Bierzo yeah, or, or Prirod or yeah. Humia, uh, uh, Monsant, uh, uh, Monastral. Yeah. I mean, God, right. I mean, like Sherry down in Jerez. I mean, there's, yeah, such, there's tons. so much going tons. on in, in, in Spain. But. Let's see. Uh, okay, Meredith. I hope that that um, that also hopefully that answered your question about uh, regions of Spain to visit. I would also say this is um, if you have other questions um, like that, uh, feel free to shoot me an email, um, and um, I can uh, you know Carlos and I can piggyback and and yeah. uh, help you. Uh, real, I mean, take the time to you know really identify some places that you might want to see outside of these, um, because like he said. Uh, there are other regions that are absolutely fabulous that are within close proximity. Like if you were to kind of land in one spot, uh, there's just so much to see um, that, um, you know, it, it just doesn't have to be Rioja. It doesn't have to be, you know, Rios Baixas. There is just a, so much uh, depending on where you're coming from. If you're coming, you know, you could scoot over to Portugal, you could, you know, scoot up to France. It's, um, you know, so uh, feel free to reach out. We're happy to, to help uh, any way, uh, any way we can. Uh, I just put my email see. address on there. Oh yeah, everybody. good deal, good deal. I'll uh, let me see. I'll, I think most um, have mine, but let me put up that on there as well. Okay, let's see. Uh, any other questions um, before we um, before we uh, retire for the evening? Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> I got one on the Albarino. Yeah. Uh, for that, I'm going to say that my wife made some delicious chocolate croissants that really went good with that Rioja. <clears throat> that was <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I was wondering on the Albarino, I, I read about it like maybe 10 years ago. I'd never heard of it and um, uh, had really enjoyed it. But it seems like you don't see very many of them around in the stores if you do it's usually martin kodak yeah occasionally there's others. i just yeah. wonder if there's a reason i guess it's just not a well-known wine but it, it just doesn't seem like there's you know a lot of variety to choose from when you're looking for it if there's a reason yeah, for I, it. 
I, I'm sure um, from a from a retail standpoint, Carlos will have can probably go deep on it. I guess you know my my impression would be, you know, I, I think uh, most Americans are clued into um, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay as a white wine. Um, you know, Albarino is tricky to pronounce. They're not real sure what's in the bottle. Um, and, uh, you know, when it comes to shelf space, uh, a lot of these wines companies can fill it up with Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, and, and Chardonnay and all sorts of uh, shapes and stripes. So um, I think it's probably just a matter of, of getting out the word and, and driving up consumer demand. But again, like we saw tonight, you know, it's a great alternative to something light and refreshing, a um, little bit more going on to me than, than um, you know, a light, uh, you know, Pinot Grigio and not quite as heavy as a, a Chardonnay. So it's a terrific, terrific wine. I just don't think people, you know, are, I just don't, don't, don't know it. So, you know, until there's more recognition in the marketplace, it's probably going to continue to um, take a little bit of backseat. But that also means it'll probably still be a, a pretty good value when you can find it. Uh, Carlos, what do you see in, in, in the shop and in the restaurants? Um, I, honestly, I, I think it's the buyer's fault. I, I think it's I think it's our fault because you yeah. know we're not I, we're, well obviously we're doing this on Zoom, and we're we're showing different grapes, different wines, different styles you know coming from Spain. But it's like you know I'm I'm not going to speak negatively about anybody that I know that's a buyer you know where I live. But you know a lot of people they stay safe. You know like they're I'm gonna sell Napa cab you know I'm gonna sell Napa cabs and I'm gonna sell yeah. uh, you know. Uh, uh, Sonoma Chardonnay, because that's what everybody wants to buy. But, you know, it, it takes people like myself, or even like you, Scott, to where we know these wines, we're experienced with these wines, we're educated on these wines, but some people don't want to take the time to educate yeah. the consumer yeah. and say, hey, sure. this wine, because, you know, uh, uh, Rias Bacius, uh, Alberino from Rias Bacius is part of our, uh, our, our uh, blind tasting grid. Like, yeah, they, yeah. like it's considered a super classic wine. Then you look at other wines like uh, Tarantes from Argentina or, you know, all these, you know, Albarino and, and even Riesling from Alsace. Like a lot of people don't look at these styles of wine or even these grapes and they are super classic. Like they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. But yeah. now, you know, like as buyers, we're just like, ah, I'll stay safe and be lazy and I'll just order, you know, Shats enough to pop and I'll, so Bordeaux and, and Burgundy, but then, you know, all these other places really get overlooked and it's such a shame, but you know, yeah, like yeah. me being a buyer at the shop that I work at, I tried to keep a very well uh, a rounded shelf where you're going to, if you come in like, Hey, I'm looking for Tracolina or I'm looking for, you know, like, I'm not going to have like another great Spanish wine, by the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, have, we could talk about another one that we could talk about, but anyway, <laughs> It's not, I'm not going to carry 10 different Albarinos, but yeah. I will have, you know, one or two Albarinos. I will have some Vouvray, you know, something a little bit different for consumers that we can educate them on. And when they come in, be like, okay, well, what is it that you're in the mood for? Like, are you looking for something that's fruity and light or do you want something that's really bitter and serious? So yeah. you know, we take that information and we go and be like, oh, well, I think you would like to try this Albarino or I think you'd like to try this, you know, this uh, Tarantes. But uh yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's up to us. It's up to yeah. wine professionals. It's up to sommeliers. It's up to buyers to, you know, to educate and teach our customers that these wines have been around for a very long time and they're absolutely delicious. So, well, great, Carlos. That's an awesome uh, explanation. Bill, I would suggest that you get a t-shirt that says, ask me about Albarino. And for <laughs> uh, those of you who want to shop um, and Karen just asked this, um, Carlos is at uh, The Pleasure is All Wine in Pelham. Uh, they have a you know, website. He's easy to find. Um, they actually do, Carlos and um, his uh, pals there actually do uh, quite a bit of um, uh, on Instagram Live. Uh, you guys do um, a tasting some uh, yeah, throughout videos. the week of wines yeah. that you have, which are really informative. And again, it just helps to just tear down those walls of intimidation. Um, if nothing else, just listen to it so you can learn how to pronounce the words so you feel more confident when you're going to ask it. But it's sometimes just listening to these things and they do it in a way that's not intimidating. They're not fussy and snobby. They're just, right. you know, they're just, they're just talking about the wine and talking about 
why they think it's a, a great deal. So, um, you know, you can find them on Facebook and Instagram, uh, but it's a great, great resource here locally. But even if you're outside of Birmingham, um, you can follow them on Instagram and, uh, and Facebook and, and really learn a lot about wine. Good stuff. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, uh, it's uh, about 845. Um, Carlos, thanks for uh, being a part of uh, the evening tonight. Uh, thanks for having I, me. I, my phone is, um, is, is, I can feel it uh, vibrating from uh, the uh, text messages that I get from Venmo. Uh, so thank you to everybody who's been um, uh, making uh, virtual tips to the Railroad Park Foundation. Um, please, um, you know, if you haven't uh, yet made a tip, please do it. Uh, they're doing incredible work there at the foundation and, and so happy that we could uh, support them tonight. So um, thank you to all the Railroad Foundation folks and the junior board that joined tonight and for helping to get the word out about tonight's event. Carlos, as always, thanks for being a, you know, really integral part of tonight's discussion and um, right, well, hope to see you all again uh, very soon. And um, please have a wonderful night. Enjoy the rest of these wines and have a, a wonderful uh, rest of the weekend and uh, hopefully our paths will all cross again soon. So um, let me get a wine glass here. Cheers, everyone. Have a great yeah, cheers. night. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.